Praise God. We want to welcome everyone. Today we're going to be in the worship of Jesus tonight.
our Savior. He's worthy of glory tonight, church. Hallelujah. As we slow it down, we're going to sing. Christ is in
prayer as we are thankful for his love and his grace that enables us to gather and hear the preaching of the word of God and his ministering power to each and every one of our lives. We want to pray for some very special needs in our nation. We know the current COVID-19, many doctors, those that are working in the medical field, those that are sick and those that are losing loved ones, we want to pray for them that God would give them grace. Remembering our president, our leadership in office, that they would be making wise decisions and having direction for this time of crisis in our, our nation as well as all over the world. And we want to remember all of our churches and our fellowship, many of them laboring in, in nations and missionaries, our leadership, Pastor Mitchell, Pastor Greg and Lisa Mitchell, and we're praying for our mother church in El Paso, Pastor Paul and Renee Stevens and the Contreras the El Paso Conference that is continuing tomorrow night and Thursday, uh, Friday night that God would wonderfully and gloriously move in that conference. Amen. We want to go to God and pray for every need. If you're here uh, online with us and you have needs in your life, you pray, you lift those to God. He'll help you. He loves you. He can minister to your life. Maybe you've just recently given your life to Jesus. You pray that God will make himself real to you and help you in your life and he is real he does want to minister i'm praying that god will anoint this mes message and speak to all of our hearts in his word amen let's go to prayer ask that you would pray with us wherever you are at let's call upon jesus and ask him to minister father we're praying tonight god as we come before you in this service uh, god that you would bring a word in season and revelation i'm praying for the anointing of the holy spirit how that each and every one listening and receiving your word god would be changed and transformed i pray for clarity and wisdom in the word of god we're lifting up every need represented god you know people's needs and you know everything god we're committing those to you believing you for souls to be saved lives to be salvaged healed and delivered god visit our nation we're praying for you to move in revival in jesus name amen glory to god what a wonderful time to be in church and we want to welcome all of you out uh, visiting us online we're so glad that you've joined us for our service here wednesday night at the door of christian fellowship church we are greatly privileged to have you joining us and we do count it a great honor if you've been started have started watching our online services i do want to welcome you some of you have sent emails and reached out and i appreciate that we want to welcome you into our church family and once we get back to business as normal, we'll invite you, invite, want to invite you to our church services here at the congregation at 3875 Main Street here in Springfield. And we are so appreciating all of you. So a couple of announcements. The conference in El Paso, for those of you that are in our congregation, all of you are uh, viewing online are also welcome. The El Paso conference uh, is going two more nights, Thursday night and Friday night. Um, it begins an hour earlier, so uh, 5 o'clock our time tomorrow night is Pastor Greg Mitchell, and then uh, they have the World Evangelism video, and then Friday night at 6 p.m. our time, Pastor Sergey Goyabev, and there will be announcing churches Thursday and Friday night, I believe, and so we're looking forward to the great expectancy uh, to what God is going to do. I encourage all of you to be believing God and gathering together and looking uh, to see what God will do and minister to you in the word in that conference. Uh, to, we also announced this week, we went live uh, online giving. We have four platforms now that you can give. Uh, one of those is through the website on the doorspringfield.com, all one word, the doorspringfield.com on the top headline. You'll find a, a button for giving, push that. It takes you to a web page, explains our online giving platform and there's a give now button there. That will take you to the giving portal and then we also have texting you can text on your cell phone uh, the phone number 541-250-3875 again that's 541-250-3875 and in the message box you type the word give and it will uh, bring a link that you can go uh, directly to the giving portal and if you're a first time giver there's information there it'll walk you through that if you have given before uh through text uh, you put in the number uh the 250-3875 and you actually can just put give in it you can give the amount there gives you that option so we're greatly appreciating those of you that have been stepping into that helping us uh, uh continue our income stream 
in the congregation. There's another the third way that you can give. If you are a member of the church and you have a church key, there is a lock box uh, inside the door to the left, white box that's secure that you can put your tithes and offerings into. And if you really want to do it the old school way and you would like to give through the mail, <laughs> you can send that to the door church at uh, 3678 Ravel, which is R E V E L L Street, Eugene, Oregon 97404. We appreciate your uh, giving. I was, as I take the offering, I was heard a story on the radio, so I actually looked it up and it was true. It's about a, it's happened in Mexico just last week. A man that was quarantined for a period of time in his house, could not leave the house quarantined because of the coronavirus. He was very hungry for Cheetos. He didn't have any Cheetos left in his house, and so he's not able to go outside the house. He's quarantined. So he came up with an idea that he would take his little dog, which is a Chihuahua, and send his Chihuahua to get uh, Cheetos for him. So he put a little note, uh, wrote a note, put it into the, attached it to the dog's collar, put a $20 bill there, and sent the dog out the door. Uh, there's a store next, uh, next to them. Uh, little dog went into the store and went up to the cashier and the cashier read the note and it said something to the effect of uh, if, uh, I would like to buy a bag of Cheetos, not the red kind, but the orange ones. I don't like the red ones. I like the orange ones. And uh, the twenty dollars is here, please. Uh, attach the Cheetos uh, to my dog's collar or put them in his mouth and he'll carry them back and the change with it. And a little PS said, don't bother my dog or mess with him because he'll bite you. Uh, so the story turns out that it actually worked. The dog, he's actually done it several times now. The little dog is very, very uh, good at getting Cheetos for his master. So people are very resourceful when they want something, especially in a situation where you are not able to go outside. Here's a very resourceful method. I'll send my little Chihuahua and we'll get some Cheetos because uh, we're hungry. So this is the uh, 2000, uh, 20. <laughs> you don't have to do things that old school. Uh, you can uh, realize that God is able to do miracles in blessing his people. And we can trust in him. If this man would trust this little dog, how much more can we trust our God who's faithful and true as we support and give and are liberal and God provides more than anything else. You can count on God to provide for you and to bless you and if you can have more faith than any thing, any animal, any person, and you can trust God more than anything else. And we want to encourage you to be faithful in your tithes and offerings and giving and supporting the work that God is doing here. We still have ongoing needs and we really need every uh, one in the church that's a faithful giver to continue to be as faithful and even be more liberal at this season. And those of you that are visiting online, you're more than welcome to help support as well. We do appreciate all that you can do. We're going to bow our heads and close our eyes. We're thanking God. Father, thank you for your grace tonight that enables us to be saved. You, you have given us wisdom. You've opened our hearts and given us direction. We thank you for the Holy Ghost. We thank you for the word, the privilege of serving you, God, and knowing you, and praying for blessing over every offering, every gift, every tithe and tither, God. Rebuke the devour, especially in this season, God of trust, in this time where we need you to move. I ask you to bless your people and do miracles in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. We're going to allow our musicians to leave the stage. We appreciate their faithful help and song service. And I really do want to thank all of you for joining us in our online services. I know many of you are viewing for the first time and being introduced to our congregation, to our church, our fellowship, what we believe. And again, if you have any questions, you're uh, viewing and maybe you've answered uh, the, the, uh, the altar call, then prayed the prayer to give your life to Jesus or your backslider and you got your heart right, please, in the website, uh, there's a contact page and you can send me an email, it comes to me. If you have any questions about the church, or you're interested in knowing more about what we believe, our website is there available for you, and you can send me a text and I can, um, or an email, I can get back to you, or you can text me at 541-968-4848, and we'll help you with every, whatever you need. I want to minister a sermon out of Romans chapter 8. 
verse 35 through 39, Romans chapter 8. This is a message entitled, The Power of Determination. I was greatly inspired by a story that I read, and we're going to read that in just a uh, I'm going to tell you that story in just a moment, but I want to begin by reading Romans chapter 8. And verse 35 through verse 39, the Bible says this, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The power of determination. The story that I read was about a professional football player who played in the 1970s. His name was Rocky uh, Blyer, and I knew about him. I grew up in that era, and I knew who he was by name, and I, but I did not know his story. Turns out that he was a high, high school football star, and he was uh, chosen by the Notre Dame Fighting Irish to play for them when he entered into college. And in the years that he was there at Notre Dame, they won a national championship. He was a very highly regarded running back, halfback. And he was drafted into the NFL by the Pittsburgh Steelers in 1968. He played that rookie season. And towards the end of the season, he was drafted into the U.S. military, the U.S. Army. Because of the Vietnam War, they were drafting young men in America. And he was one of those that was drafted. And he was sent to Vietnam, and when he was in training, he chose to uh, volunteer to go to South Vietnam and fight in the Vietnam War. And so when he was there just several, uh, just several months on a routine patrol, they were out patrolling uh, rice paddies in the countryside uh, for, uh, uh, on a routine patrol, his platoon was ambushed, and Rocky was shot in the left leg, and after he was uh, laying there wound, uh, wounded, a grenade that landed nearby uh, blew up and uh, uh, he received shrapnel in his right leg and his hip area. And part of his uh, right foot was also torn off in that blast. He uh, later was awarded the Bronze Star for uh, his military service and a Purple Heart for being wounded in combat. When he was recovering in the hospital a few months, weeks later, they told him that doctors believed he would never play football ever again. And while he was in recovery, the owner of the Pitt Pittsburgh Steelers, Art Rooney, sent a postcard to him overseas asking him to come to Steelers workout camp uh, because they needed him on the team. And so after his military discharge, he went to Pittsburgh and began to work out with the team. He said he could not walk without pain as he arrived there. And he was actually waived twice from the team in the next two years. He did not make the team. But Blyer never gave up. Four years later, he made the team as, starting, uh, as a starter at running back. And he became the second of the Steelers' rushing weapons alongside one of the most famous running backs in all of NFL history, Franco Harris. And in 1976, both Franco Harris and Rocky Blyer rushed for over 1,000 yards apiece, making them only the second team at that time to ever do that. Blyer played seven seasons for the Steelers. He played in the first four Super Bowl Steeler victories, including catching the game-winning touchdown from quarterback Terry Bradshaw in Super Bowl XIII. At the time of his retirement, he had become the Steelers' fourth all-time leading rusher. When I was reading his story, I was struck by a man's determination to 
finish his course that he set out to do in life. I want to talk to you about that thought of the power of determination. Begin with looking at the truth of life. Our scripture that was written to the Roman church by the Apostle Paul, he writes to them from a Christian perspective. And he's looking at life and examining the Christian life. And he says, what shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, or peril, or sword? As he's looking at the Christian life, it's a snapshot of right now and the thought of the future that we live our life for. Here's an eye on surviving and making it, getting through things and beyond things that happen in a person's life. He's casting life in a certain way. He's telling us that we will go through things. We will go through trials and temptations. There can be setbacks and failures and even sins. But he asks the question, who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation, shall distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. So he asks this question, who shall separate us? Or better put, what shall separate us from Christ? He's actually asking the question, is there anything that will separate us from our Lord and the love that he has given us? This is a question that we all need to ask ourselves. We need to ask ourselves that right now. We need to ask that question often in life because of there are outside forces, there are inside forces, there are things that are our fault, things that are not our fault, there are trials, there are afflictions, there are setbacks, there can even be sin. And he's asking us this question, is there anything that happens in our life, in time or in circumstance, that can have the ability to separate us from Jesus? Is there an area of vulnerability? Are there areas of our life that there's uh, the enemy can gain access to or areas of our heart that are vulnerable to temptation or to the world or to the trials that we go through or even the pain of the suffering that might happen as a Christian? Is there a vulnerability where something can happen that would begin to take us away from the love of Jesus. Can anything get between us and Jesus? We are to be, uh, Jesus is to be the Lord of our life. We're to be surrendered to him, serving him, loving him. But the question is, can anything get between us and Jesus? Can anything separate us? He's asking, what is our mindset in life? What is our mindset? What is our heart like daily? What is the mindset about what might happen down the road? What trial, what upheaval might be able to separate us from the Lord? I pray as the church that what our inability to meet here and have regular fellowship and outreach and prayer and all the things that we normally are you being separated from Jesus? We may not be here. Yes, we're separated as brethren, maybe from the assembly. But brother or sister, Christian, are you being separated from the Lord right now? What is our mindset of life? Is there a staunch determination that says, no, nothing can separate me from Jesus Nothing will separate me from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, are we committed to Jesus and unwilling to let that happen? See, a lot of what will happen in life is based on what our determination is. And it takes a sobriety of thinking and, and being willing to think about the hard issues of life and the difficult things and predetermine that I am not going to be moved by those things. I'm not going to let those things pull me away from the Lord. I'm not going to let things that happen to me, things that go on around me or even in my own heart, 
allow them to separate me from the Lord Jesus. It has to be a determination. And no matter what I go through, and no matter what happens, no matter what Satan tests me or try, tempts me with, or, or whatever trial happens, uh, that I am not going to be removed or allow anything to come between me and Jesus. Let's look second of all at the real life at real life. Because real life is this. Things happen. The truth is things do happen. We if you were to ask a month ago, would we have to watch church online? Would we be forbidden to come to the assembly? Would we not be able to gather in prayer meetings and outreaches and revivals and go to conferences? We would that would never happen. Well, things do happen. I've watched Christians that have every privilege to come to church and not want to come to church. And when there is no interruption in church, they, they'd rather work than go to church. They'd rather sleep in the morning than get up and pray and read their Bible and, and get a hold of God for their life. Uh, there's those who choose career and other things over destiny and God's purpose for them. Truth is, things will happen. Life does not always go the way we envision it. I'm all about vision. If you've been listening to my sermons for very long, you know I preach about having a vision and doing something for God with your life. But how many times does life not always work out the way we envision it? And are we prepared for that? Are we prepared, prepared to be able to say, but no matter what happens, nothing will take me or come between Jesus and myself. Life does not always go the way we envision it. Rocky Blyer, he had a dream, even as a young man, a teenager, when he was playing in high school, he had a dream to play in the National Football League. He made it. He went on to play, as I, as I have the illustration, to play for Notre Dame at that time, like the top school in college. Then he got drafted in the uh, 16th round. He made it. He's envisioning his dream. He's living his dream and his rookie year. He receives a card in the mail from the U.S. government that he's been drafted into the military. And then he's sent to Vietnam. That was not his decision. That didn't fit his dream. Getting drafted into the military, uh, that's whether you want to or not. In those days, if you received a draft card, you were called to report or you would could face very serious charges. And it was not something that you may have wanted in your life. You may not have that choice, but it was your duty. That didn't, was not part of the script of his life. He goes into combat and one of the first firefights in, in, the, in combat, he's wounded. He's wounded so uh, in his leg. That was what a running back makes his money on in the NFL is his legs and his feet and both, le uh, both legs and one foot was severely wounded. One with a rifle bullet and the other by gray shrapnel. There you're lying there in the bed of the hospital and they're telling you you're never going to play football again, Rocky. Seems like there's no hope at that point. You know, things that happen to, in life have great power to influence us. Those things can hinder our walk with God. They can distract us. They can discourage us. And sometimes they have the power to divert us. We know that God wants something for our life. We're following that direction. We're going in the way, way God wants us to go. But things that happen can divert us, can turn our focus away, get us away from focusing on God and His will and His purpose, and get us trusting in ourself. So the question is, what do you do when things do not go 
as planned. What do you do when there are trials? What do you do when there is a staggering assault against your life or there's temptation in your life or your own flesh begins to desire other things what do you do because you're going to have to make a decision what do you do in those times again it's a snapshot of life and it's also the totality of life what do we do when things happen our scripture is not only challenging us in that aspect, but it gives us a glorious answer. And that is the power and the ability to overcome anything. There is an overcoming power. And in our scripture, it's not about self. It's not what self can do. It's not our own will and willpower. That is the number one factor of determination. It's not just ourself. But there is an outside influence. And the scripture says it's the power of Jesus' love. Jesus' love is not a theological thought. It's not static. It's not just a story. It's real. Jesus' love is not just an acknowledged thing. Oh yeah, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves me. But no, His love is real. His love has power. You can feel His love. You can experience His love. You can be filled with His love. And Jesus' love is our motivating factor in life. His love gives us an overcoming dimension. Knowing someone loves us does something to us. When you know that somebody loves you, it gives you an extra desire to do things or accomplish or, or take care of things. If you're married, when you know your husband loves you, it stirs you to do your best and to fulfill uh, your, your, his needs and to do right and to be faithful. And there's times where it'll help you do what you know you need to do because you know he loves you and you want to love him. And same thing as a husband. You know your wife loves you. It's going to give you an extra sense of awareness. It's going to give you an extra sense of strength. Maybe a bit of encouragement or courage that yes, I can do this and I'm going to do this because she loves me. I'm willing to sacrifice. I'm willing to go beyond. I'm willing to get up every single day and go to work and provide. I'm willing to stand in the gap and pray and be a man of God because she loves me. When you're a child, your parents love you. It does something to you where you want to please them. You want to obey them. You want to do your best because they love you. It stirs that as a parent. Your children, you love your children. It makes you want to do right and stay right and do the right things. Work on your marriage because you know your kids need it. When you're in love, somebody, somebody loves you. It stirs you to do things that you might... Otherwise, say, ah, I don't feel like doing it. Laziness might rise up or self-will or whatever kind of distraction. But when somebody loves you, you feel it. It's with you. It's an awareness. And it, want, it stirs in you and want to do things the right way. Continue on. Overcome whatever dimension. So knowing Jesus loves us does more than anything else could. Verse 37, yes, yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. He starts by saying, what can separate us? Can anything separate us? What can separate us from the love of Christ? And the result is, in all of these things that we go through, in all these things that are in life, uh, that come against us, uh, that we experience in trial and temptation, even in sin, uh, can those things separate us? Paul says, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors uh, through Him who loved us. That because 
He loves us. We're able to do right. We're able to continue on. We're able to break through. We're able to stay faithful because of that love. This has to be the underlying foundation that we find our strength in. It's going to try every one of you that are listening. If you just gave your life to Jesus, you just need to get close to Jesus' love. If you're backslidden and you've got your heart right, you just need to draw close to the love of God and let it fill you and motivate you to serve and to love and to read your Bible, to pray, just to have a relationship with Him. He will speak to you about what He wants you to do in life and He will give you a, a desire to live for Him. But I just want to say to those that are Christian, you've been saved for a while, you say, well, I, I love God. Yeah, and, and when we're here in church and there's constant accountability and there's constant church services here in ministry, and you know, you know the standards uh, and all that goes with that. There's, we're, we're a busy church, man. We don't play games. We're not just playing church on Sunday for an hour and then the rest of the week we don't even think about Jesus. No, we have, we have three services uh, on a Sunday. Sunday school, Sunday morning, and Sunday night. And if you're a serious man, we have serious spins on Sunday morning at 7.30 in the morning. And we have practices, and those in ministry are practicing sometimes one or two days or evenings of the week. We have a Wednesday night service normally. We have Friday night outreach, Saturday morning prayer and outreach, and a Saturday night concert. We are very busy, and when you're in the flow of that, it's it's you know you get used to it. You get used to the flow, and you're involved in it. But what happens when all of that's gone, and you're left to serve God yourself? All of a sudden, is that underlying foundation love? That we do this because we love Jesus? And we go to church faithfully, we read our Bible, we pray every day, and we go to outreach, and we are faithful to the assembly and all that God is doing, and we want to answer God's call, we want to preach or, or be a missionary or be a church pillar, and that's our fire, and that's our zeal, and that's our passion. When that's taken away, is it still the love of Christ? Or is it very easy just to say, well, I'll pray another day. I'm tired. I'm going to sleep in today. Or I'll, I'll, I'll do it next time. I'll, I'll watch the, the online service later instead of when church is. Or I'll worry about some other things. I know God wants me to be reading my Bible. I know He wants me to be following up and reaching out to people and trying to do what he what, what 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 I can do for God the same and growing and learning and being a Christian that underlying foundation when the structure is removed of, of how to serve God I'm wondering as a pastor how many of us are serving God still have you changed your patterns have you changed your routine you know you know maybe you're not working right now you know are you getting up at noon are you still getting up at 7 and praying if you're a man? If you're a mom, mother? Are you still faithful to the assembly? Are you meeting with us every time there's church? See, it's for these, these times where nobody sees or nobody knows that our real foundation is tested. And I don't know why the COVID thing is happening. I have no idea why all this is going on, but I know it's shaking up the church. Not just our buddy, the church all over. It's really examining Christianity. Are we real Christians? Do we do it because we are Christian and we're saved and we love God and those are our convictions? Or simply because we're caught in a flow and that's just what we do when we're Christians? It'll test your heart. And the love of Jesus has to be the foundation that we find our strength in. What does Jesus' love do? Well, it secures grace and mercy. He secured for us grace and mercy. He secured forgiveness because He loves us. Because He loved us, He gave His life for us to give us grace to purchase forgiveness. Jesus' love is filled with goodness. Jesus' love also means He can relate to us and He can help us. Jesus can relate to us completely. 
Hebrews 2.18 in the Amplified Version says, For because he himself, in his humanity, has suffered in being tempted, tested, and tried, he is able immediately to run to the cry of, a, of assist and relieve those who are being tempted and tested and tried, and who therefore are being exposed to suffering. He can relate to what we go through. Because of love, this is why love is the motivating power that allows us to be more than conquerors. We can overcome and conquer, uh, yes, by the power of determination, but by the love of Jesus that gives us the strength, gives us the glorious power. It's purchased for us by His death and His resurrection and His love. I get up and pray every morning because Jesus loves me and I love Him. I read my Bible because He loves me and I love Him. I'm here preaching tonight because He loves me and I love Him. It is His love that brings the knowledge that He is with us at all times and He's helping us. He's involved in our life. He's there to strengthen and to encourage if we will open our heart to Him. He's there to minister. Let's close with the power of vision. A goal is a very powerful thing. When I was working in the secular world and worked in a, the uh, business community and the financial community, uh, institutions, one of the main uh, things we were trained in is you got to have goals. This had, had to do with careers and things. I had a, I had a career goal. That's to be a pastor. That was my goal. But anyway, would say you need to have a goal if you're going to be successful in your career. You're going to be able to advance. It's a very powerful thing. If you have a goal, you set goals, sometimes little goals that lead up to the bigger goal, but you have a goal, and that is what you're pointing your life to because it's an extremely powerful principle. They call it goal in the world. In the church, we call it vision. But it's something that you're striving to attain to. Without a vision, the people perish. Another translation says, without a vision, the people cast off restraints. This is why Christians cast off restraint when there's no need for uh, There's nothing to restrain them. Uh, so they'll cast off their own restraint because they don't have a vision. If you have a vision, it keeps you faithful and has a restraining power. Something that you are striving to attain it stirs us to go on in difficult times it stirs us to go on during setbacks and trials and the upheavals of life it gives us a desire to fight through that and to be determined to finish our course and fulfill our vision and our dreams just like rocky blyer he had a relentless pursuit of his dreams that pushed him uh, from his days as a wounded veteran to a four-time Super Bowl champion with the Steelers. And he was determined to finish his goals despite the setbacks, even a series of progressively harder setbacks. And I, some people allow the smallest things to turn them away. Little bumps in the road, little small things, they turn away, they get discouraged, they become defeated. But when you have a goal, it stirs a determination to achieve it. Blair never gave up. Rocky Blair never gave up. He worked for five or six hours a day. This is after he's trying to get back into the NFL. He's been wounded. He's trying to recover after surgeries and all the pain. He worked for five or six hours a day to get himself into a supreme physical shape. When asked why he did it, he said, Sometime in the future you won't have to ask yourself, What if? What if I did it? What if I tried? What if I tried harder? He said, I didn't lose a leg. I didn't lose a foot. I was going to come back and play. That was my desire. Amen. Determination is a heart issue. It has to do with what's in us, our heart. It's a faith issue. What do we believe? What do we believe about God? What do we believe about His will? 
And thirdly, it's a vision issue. Paul says in our text, we are made more than conquerors. We're not just conquerors, church. We are more than conquerors. That through Christ's love, we are more than conquerors. Yes, there's something to the power of the human will and determination. Rocky Blyer proved that. But you and I, our goals are far loftier than winning a Super Bowl. Our goals are to do the will of God and finish the race and accomplish His purposes. And it's only by Christ's love that we are more than conquerors. We have a determination in our heart. Whatever it is, this thing will not divert me. This thing will not overcome me. What it does is it draws us to Jesus. We turn to Christ for help. We begin to lift our eyes and say, Jesus, you love me. You will be able to help me. You can give me strength. You can give me courage. And we turn to the one who paid the ultimate price and his whole life pointed towards the worst death in human history, which is the cross. And even on the cross, he lifted his eyes unto heaven and said to the Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And we can look unto him and we can say, if Jesus could do that for me, then He'll help me do what He wants me to do for Him. And we can turn to Him for that strength and that help, even if it's difficult, even if it's a hard time, even if it's a difficult season. We say, Jesus is going to help me because He loves me. And He will always help us. He will always help us. There's power experienced when you know that someone loves you and it gives you tremendous courage. But Rocky Blyer's success did not end after football. He retired in 1980. Today, he's a very successful businessman. He's an author. He has his own uh, motivational speaker network. He's a, he's a motivational speaker who travels all over telling his story, motivating people, trying to help people achieve their goals. He's become very, very, very successful. You know, what we go through can define us in a good way, even if it's extremely difficult, even if it's very painful. Even if it's a huge setback where it doesn't fit the vision or the way we envision life would go, it can still define us in a good way. He used his war wounds and his setbacks to further his ability to do things in life. It left a mark on him, yes, but he uses it this day to do a, a, for, for an advancing of his vision. You're going to go through things as a Christian. If you're a brand new Christian, I'm not trying to scare you, but you're going to experience things because all of life is like that. God's going to help you. Jesus is going to help you. And if you, when you go through things, they can define you in a very good way and mark you, so to speak, as an overcomer. And people can point and say, that person there is an overcomer. They may point at Rocky Blyer and call him all kinds of things, but one thing they cannot deny is the man is an overcomer and a conqueror. And everybody respects that. Because he didn't just fold up in a, in a cocoon and say, I give up in life. He didn't just stay in that rice paddy and say, I, I, this is where my life is going to end. Uh, he didn't stay in that hospital bed uh, overseas and say, this is where my life is going to end. I'm just going to get on disability and just live my life in a, in a shell, in a cocoon. Uh, he didn't quit when they cut him from the team twice uh, in a uh, training camp for the, pro, for, for the Steelers. Uh, he didn't quit after that. And he didn't quit in anything in life like that. Overcoming and conquering gives us a powerful testimony. Something that God can use powerfully to help and to minister to others with. And he goes around now motivating people to accomplish things and their dreams and their goals. He's very inspirational. And when you and I will allow God to use us we can be a help to people, we can minister to others, and we can be very inspirational to other people. We can give other people hope that if we can do it, they can do it. 
One of the things that really helped me as a new Christian is looking at people that serve God a while, or Christians for a while, that they can do it, I can do it. I heard their stories, I heard their testimony that if they can make it through that, and they can survive that, and they can stay safe through that, I can do that. And it gave me hope for what I went through. In many cases, this is how people see how good God is. They watch and observe our life as a Christian. And they see the joy, they see peace, even though we're going through very, very difficult things perhaps, and they can see how good God is. And it brings a powerful testimony to God. And they can see that Jesus is the answer for their life. This is why right now, this time in our country and our world, the last thing Christians needed to be, be is afraid and cowering and worried. We know the end of the story. We know what it's all about. Jesus is coming back. God wants to visit our world. And we have the hope Jesus is the answer for everybody's life. Stay on the course as a Christian, brother, sister. Stay the course. Fight through. Believe God. Jesus is love. Cry out to the Lord. Let Him love you and help you. Have a power of determination. Because in the end, it's going to show a lot of people that Jesus is the answer for their life. Amen. I want to ask you to bow your head with me and close your eyes. Maybe you're listening to this online for the first time you've tuned in. Or you are just started watching our online services. Maybe you said the prayer. I've heard many have. Many, many people have been praying, uh, giving their lives to Jesus or giving their heart back to the Lord. Very happy for you, thankful for you. God really is going to help you. Jesus is the answer for not only for your life, but everybody's life. You can make it through anything because Jesus loves you. You can survive any kind of problem in life, issue in life, because Jesus loves you. He'll help you. Maybe you're watching for the first time or you've been watching these online services, but you have not made a decision to give your life to Jesus. You've been holding back or you're not quite ready. But you've been watching because God's been drawing you dealing with you, wondering what's going on in the world around you, does it make sense? But it may never make a whole lot of sense without Christ in you. The Bible says that our carnal mind cannot comprehend the things of God. We must be born again. Jesus said in John 3, 3, except a man be born again, he shall not see the kingdom of heaven. If you want to know why things happen and what the Bible means and all this stuff about Jesus and Christianity, you have to realize we're dead in our sins and trespasses and our carnal mind and our our uh, sinful nature we're not going to be able to under, totally understand God before I gave my life to Jesus I was very confused I'm very uh, I was filled with questions but the, the night I gave my life to Jesus it was like scales fell from my eyes. I knew that God was real. I knew that the Jesus that Jesus had died for me and He was real and I wanted to live for Him. Because a spiritual thing happened, a supernatural, I was born again. I was born again by the Spirit. And I became a brand new person, brand new creation in Christ. I was, I was 19, that's almost 30 years ago now. And you're been tuning in and you're you're right there it's like, I just you need to give your life to Jesus right now maybe you've been backslidden for some time and you as a backslider have been saying one of these days well today needs to be that day today is the day of salvation we have no guarantees we must get right with God I want to pray with you those of you that are wanting to be saved those of you that are backslidden want to get your heart right just pray this prayer with me a very simple prayer called a sinner's prayer and you give your life to Jesus. He'll come into your heart and save you. He loves you. I want you to pray with me right now. Bow your head and close your eyes. Repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross and you shed your blood and you rose from the dead because you love me. 
and I confess that I am a sinner. I confess all my sin to you, and I want you to forgive me. I'm asking you to come into my heart. Forgive me all of my sins. Fill me with your love. I want to know you. Make yourself real to me. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to pray for you right now. God, I'm praying for these precious people that have said that prayer out loud to you in their hearts to you, God. Fill them with your spirit. Fill them with your power. Make yourself real to them. I bind all demonic strategy that would seek to confuse them. And I speak the power of God upon their life right now. In the powerful name of Jesus, I claim the blood over their life. Amen. I want to pray for your Christian. You're here in this service. I want you to keep your head bowed, your eye closed. We can find out a lot about who we are as a Christian when the trials of life come, the temptations, setbacks, failures. Maybe even when there's no restraint anymore, we're not here in every service and everything in that ministry and everything's got us going in a, in, a, in a structure. About that structure, are we still doing what we always do because we love Jesus and He loves us? Is Jesus challenging you because you've slacked off? In your prayer life, you slacked off in your Bible, or you slacked off in your faithfulness. It's not very obvious when we have church and you're not here, but if we have it online and you're not there, who's going to know? Jesus knows. And who are you serving? I encourage you, at this time of where we are not allowed to be in church, to be drawing closer to Jesus. I've heard people telling me, Pastor, I can't wait to get back to church. I can't wait to get back to the assembly. I, first, I, I didn't realize how much I loved it, how much I needed it, how much I was ever going to miss it. Didn't know that there would be a day where we couldn't go to church. I just thought it always would be there. We take it so for granted. You will have a vision. Nothing will separate me. No, I am not going to let anything separate me from Jesus. I will make a determination. That I'm going to draw nearer to Him all the more. I'm going to let Him help me. I'm going to pray to Him and ask Him for strength. Ask Him to help me. One day, your life will be a great testimony to many other people. It'll be motivational, inspirational to them. And Jesus will use your life. Amen. I want to ask you to turn where you're at and pray in your seat there. We're going to have an actual altar call. Like we always do at church. You have an altar call right there wherever you are at. Pray. Be honest. Talk to God. And uh, my wife is going to sing a song. And while we do that, I want you praying, asking the Lord. Maybe there's areas of confession. God's dealing with you. Or He's drawing you to His love. What can separate us from the love of God? Can anything separate us from the love of Jesus? Let nothing separate you. Pray to Him right now. Yes, God, I'm asking you to move by the Holy Spirit. God, you're able to break all confusion. You're able to bring clarity and wisdom and discernment to hearts. I'm praying and standing in the gap right now, God, that you're going to speak to every heart. Fill us with your spirit. Fill us with your power and your love that would be that motivating factor in every season of life, every trial, every assault and setback, even failure and sin, God, that nothing would come between us and on the love that you've given us and the love that we have for you, God. Set our hearts on fire, Father. Yes, we believe in you, Jesus. We believe in you, Lord. Hallelujah. Loose, O Holy Ghost, fire. Let the Spirit of God fall upon your church. God, we desperately need you. We seek you, O God. Oh, we're asking you. And you pour out your Spirit. You move and you strengthen. I pray for new believers, God. Those that are bachelor, that are coming back to you supernaturally strengthen them, help them, give them anointing and power to overcome, break the yoke by the anointing, give them victory and joy, God, show them your will, show them your way, in Jesus' name, we love you, we give you the glory and the praise, Father, wonderful Jesus, amen, let's give God praise, let's worship Him right now, thanking and glorifying His name, Oh, we give you glory, 
Father, we worship you. Amen. Amen. If you uh, said that prayer with me, or you have recently, please contact me on the website, the door springfield.com. Send me an email. You can call me at 541-968-4848. I'd love to hear from you. If I can offer my services as a pastor, uh, I want to make myself available for that. For all those in the church, the faithful saints, uh, I encourage you that you're drawing near to Jesus during this time as much as possible within the guidelines that are set forth. Fellowship, love one another, and uh, let's, let's not let the enemy drive a wedge or do anything to get between us and Jesus. Uh, and tomorrow night at 5 and Friday night at 6 is the conference in El Paso, and the website is El Paso uh, Christian Church, El Paso Christian Church, and you can find the live stream there. We're also praying an hour before uh, those services in our home, so I encourage you to do that as well. Let's spell our heads and close our eyes. We're going to dismiss. We have service uh, Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. We'll have another online service Sunday at 7 p.m. in the evening. I'll have another message. Please join us. Lord bless you. Father, thank you for your word and your grace, your presence here. I ask your blessing as we are dismissed. God, let our hearts be strengthened in you. We love you in Jesus' name.